no news to anybody, new propulsion technologies introduces a whole suite of new problems. Um, you know, on the right hand side, we just have a couple of, of new novel technologies. And while some of these look like aircraft, uh, we're noticing, you know, they're, we're looking at many motors. For redundancy purposes, we're starting to see, um, you know, quite a few motors also for efficiency purposes. Um, these motors are going to higher and higher voltages, which isn't necessarily a constructural concern, uh, but does lead to challenges. Lower voltages typically mean more weight, um, so very weight driven in this new world. Um, these machines are inverter driven, and and these inverter driven motors and, and this inverter is turning on and off a battery very quickly. Um, in the you know eight to twenty in some aerospace applications, sixty kilohertz. These high frequency electrical signals um, are causing EMI and, and they're causing all kinds of, of other uh, issues in, in the aircraft itself. For redundancy purposes, we're looking at going to higher phase counts, um, higher phase machines, more machines. Again, we're just getting this, this level of complexity that is difficult to characterize. And we're doing all this to push efficiencies higher, push weights lower. And anytime we're doing that, we run into a whole suite of, of test and measurement challenges. Um, now, kind of kind of separated from the many motors, high voltage and inverter driven, we get into the actual machines themselves. And one of the trends we're seeing is lightweighting. And lightweighting obviously makes a lot of sense. Uh, the problem with lightweighting motors is that you're lowering the inductance. When you lower the inductance, inductance of the machine, you're not filtering out those high frequency signals as much. Uh, this results in current ripple. And current ripple, while it might not matter, results in torque ripple. And torque ripple is going to cause torsional vibrations. It's actually um, a, 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 a torsional vibration of the shaft. And, and what, as we'll find, this, this can cause bending moments in propellers. So this is kind of the, the landscape. We basically have a completely new propulsion structure that not only needs to be characterized electrically, but also mechanically because of these torque ripples, because of these vibrations. So let's, let's take a step back. That's kind of the million mile view. Um, our basic electric aircraft has a pretty standard electric powertrain. It's got a power source. This could be hydrogen. This could be a battery. Pick your poison. Um, but it's supplying DC power to an inverter. This inverter is operating you know, somewhere in the 10 to 60 kilohertz range to try to make us a sine wave. The sine wave is going into the electric machine, and this electric machine is creating rotation. And sometimes this rotation is going directly to a propeller or it's going to a gearbox. Um, actually, when we start looking at this propulsion system, you know, we've got kind of four discrete elements and, and there's always trade-offs. And I think as a high level view, looking at these trade-offs will kind of frame us up for the coming sections. So trade-off one is, is kind of, do I have a direct drive with a propeller or do I use a gearbox? And this is really gonna be weight versus efficiency, speed versus weight. There's a few things tied up there. But from the structural perspective, this could affect where those um, orders are coming from, and where those, where those vibration orders or, or those modes are coming from. We have the trade-off always of switching frequency versus efficiency in that inverter. When we raise the switching frequency, we're gonna inherently lower the efficiency. Um, and as we'll see in a coming section, this is, this is pretty important. We have this issue of motor weight versus torsional vibrations. If we increase the back iron of the motor, we make a bigger motor. We could filter out a lot of that content, but we're going to have more weight. If we reduce that mass, we're going to largely result in torsional vibrations. And it kind of cuts down to we have, and this is going to be the central thesis of what I talk about today. We have this really kind of balancing act of efficiency versus vibration which directly ties into a ground vibration test and understanding how the structures react to these motors. All right, so let's let's get into the nerd stuff. Um, these inverters, some of you might be quite familiar, some of you might be pretty new to them. Um, I'll, I'll make the assumption that, that there's a lot of new people. Um, the inverter PWM output, and it's a phrase you'll hear, is, is a series of square waves. And my graph in the right-hand side, this blue, we have these Square waves at a various pulse width. And if you filter out this square wave, you get this red current signature. So 
basically the voltage is the natural phenomena, the current is the filtered down version. And we can see this PWM output. If we look at the sine wave, um, this is this has got a lot of action going on. We've got uh, uh, this current ripple at at the switching frequency, and and this is uh, this is going to cause issues because this PWM voltage is getting translated to this high frequency current. This high frequency current in hand is getting turned into uh, torque ripple. It's getting turned into high frequency magnetics. It's getting turned into torsional vibrations. Now, fortunately, the motor, the motor itself, this series of iron and winding, acts as a filter to remove a lot of harmonics. But like I said previously, if we reduce that, that filter, if we make that motor have a lower inductance, if we reduce that mass, we're not going to filter out as many harmonics. So low inductance machines filter fewer harmonics, and then current ripple is reflected in mechanical torque ripple. And this kind of high frequency current we see is going to get translated right to torque ripple. And, and that is going to be something that Doug is going to highlight in, in the software demo, is that this current is getting translated right into frequencies that are going to affect the structure. So this motor construction affects the electrical harmonics. So we can't just uh, step away from this. And electrical harmonics are getting translated right into vibrations. All right. Uh, continuing on that fact, electrical harmonics cause vibrations. So high frequency electrical signals, voltages and currents become high frequency torque and vibration. And my example on the right hand side, while it might not be obvious, I've got three accelerometers in my top view. This is a, a time versus amplitude. I've got current in red and I've got torque in purple. And if I just take an FFT of all these signals, we can see that my purple torque has a frequency somewhere you know, around uh, 2.5 kilohertz. My current is a pole shift away, so that's got a, a frequency that's a, you know, an order loader lower or so. But we see this torque, and this torque output has vibrations, or you know, it has, there's vibrations at the same frequency as that torque. And this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but this is showing us that this current is getting turned into this torque, and this torque is causing these vibrations. Now, this is a rather high frequency vibration. Um, there's going to be lower frequency vibrations as well that Doug's going to highlight. Um, but different frequency of vibrations has different implications. Lower frequencies are going to be more structural and kind of classical flutter. Higher frequencies might affect things like whirl flutter. Um, so it's really interesting stuff. But if we think about it, you know, it's, it's pretty simple physics. The magnetics caused by these currents have radial and tangential forces, and that radial force is getting transferred to the housing. Um, so inverters are causing torque ripple and vibrations. This electrical phenomena, this computer controlled phenomena is causing noise and vibration. So the inverter operation has mechanical implications. We can't separate the electrical from the mechanical. Now, how do we minimize electrical harmonics? And I, I've gone over a few of these topics already, but, but I think it's important to enforce. We can raise the inductance of the machine, but that's gonna add weight. We can add line filters. We can add in capacitors and inductors. These also add weight. So anytime we try to reduce these harmonics, we try to reduce these vibrations, we're adding weight, which it's really bad for the aircraft. Um, higher switching frequencies add losses. If we lower the switching frequency, we are going to introduce more harmonics. If we raise the switching frequency, we're gonna reduce harmonics, but we're gonna add losses. Um, and then lastly, these inverters are controlled by a computer. We can do active control. Um, you can do torque ripple suppression. You can do uh, harmonic suppression. It's basically um, active noise canceling that like these headphones have, uh, exact same phenomena. But again, this adds losses. So we can do stuff in the computer to reduce these vibrations or adding losses. And, and my illustration on the right, I, it's simple, but you know, we have this DC power input, and everything we do, we raise the switching frequency, we add losses. We uh, raise the temperature, we add losses. There's just random losses that are happening by nature of, of a high frequency system. We get to that AC power. So AC power goes into the motor. Higher temperature, losses. Higher frequency, losses. Higher speeds, losses. All these things we do affect the losses, and we really need this mechanical power to be as efficient as possible. So range and weight are always trade-off with vibrations. 
it's just kind of this necessary evil we're facing. And, and again, in these aircraft structures, it matters, as Doug will show. Um, so testing. What do we need to do? Testing needs new electric propulsion methods. Um, you know, OK. So we need validation for both flight and functionality. And the example on the right-hand side is a electric motor test stand um, from, from ES Aero. This is a public NASA document um, where you know, we're measuring torque, speed, voltage, current. Um, but what are we testing? What are we looking for? Well, we need to understand the efficiency. So we need to measure the efficiency of both the motor and the inverter. We need to make sure that we're going to get the range, distance, and, and safety margin that we're expecting from these motors. Motor and inverter, uh, we need to evaluate the control. We need to make sure that we're suppressing torque ripple in areas where we want. We need to make sure we're hitting those power points when we need them. Um, we're also running failure testing, durability testing, um, electrical system evaluation. We're hooking up 10 motors together or seven motors or whatever it is and looking at how they interact electrically to make sure we're not having faults for when we take off. So we're analyzing this whole electrical system. What we're finding is that with all these electric aircraft tests, all these electric motor tests, we're measuring a ton of vibrations. You know, on the order of double the vibration channels as electric channels. And that's because we want to characterize exactly what's happening in that motor and align it this inverter switching, align those frequencies, align those events to really understand how the system reacts. And, and fortunately, you can do a lot of this in one location. Um, so this is this is my little sales pitch for what what this type of system might look like. You know, we've got our inverter, we've got our motor, and maybe we have you know several motors and inverters. We can bring all of those signals into one HBM eDrive system. HBM eDrive, uh, you know, if anybody wants to learn more about measuring all these signals very accurately in one place, please connect with me offline. We can bring all the voltage measurements, the current measurements, the accelerometers, the torques, the speeds, all synchronously recorded with one eDrive system. We have the live display. Uh, so during the test, you can really analyze that data in detail, um, but we can also export directly to BK Connect, and, and that's what Doug's going to show in a moment. So all signals can be simultaneously measured for a variety of tests. You might be saying to yourself, okay, but why do I need to measure these things together? And it really comes down to simplification. Um, you know, if we have our powertrain, battery, inverter, motor, gearbox, and we measure all those signals in one location, we can do a system level analysis in both the frequency domain and the time domain with one data set. We can understand that all in one place. So that's that's pretty cool. You know, we can look at the orders of voltage, current, acceleration, and, and microphones to really understand how does voltage affect audible noise? How does current affect the vibration? And we can also look at things in the time domain and say, here's my voltage, here's my current, here's my torque ripple. Uh, and we can really streamline these validations with one test. We can look at efficiency, Sound vibration, control, and calibration with one test stand, with one common instrument, one common software suite. Really makes an elegant testing process and, and can save some money and time in communication between groups. The guys doing the motor control can speak the same language as the guys doing the GVT. Um, and then all of this data can be pulled into simulation for electrical machines or simulation for structures. Um, so that's really my pitch. These these Machines are becoming infinitely complex. The electrical signals directly affect the vibration. And we have this interesting trade-off between measuring efficiency and, and minimizing vibrations and maximizing range that we really need to understand the interaction between that inverter and the vibration of the system so that somebody like Doug can come in and um, start to really help you understand your structural elements. So with that, I'll hand over to Doug. Uh, he's a real expert. You'll enjoy hearing him speak. Thanks, Mitch. I appreciate it. And uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to now share my screen. So as uh, Mitch mentioned and everything he discussed with you, these new electric and hybrid aircraft definitely will have structural concerns. 
you know, if you look at the design of some of these, you know, um, you're going to notice some commonality. One is the number of motors that are now being put on the wing. You know, it's not just one or two on each wing. Now you've got multiple. The other thing that's common is for efficiency, every one of these motors are prop driven. So basically, now you went back to what I would consider sort of older technology because you can get increased lift and the efficiency is a lot better of being able to take off and land vertically. So there's where these structural concerns start coming in. So part of that structural concern and for airworthiness and everything else, flutter is somewhat of the main focus. So there's two sort of uh, types of flutter, classical and whirl. Classical flutter is um, basically an instability in the airframe, say the wing, the fuselage, the control surfaces. And that instability is due to the aerodynamic and elastic forces. Where whirl flutter is a, a little bit of a different beast, it's due to more of the stiffness you know, and damping between the connectivity of the motor to the wing or to the aircraft. So these two sort of play together sometimes, um, but you really need to understand what frequencies they're at. And, you know, um, basically trying to make sure you don't align, say, your excitations you know, with those structural modes of the aircraft. So basically, uh, instead of killing you with slides, and I've got a bunch more, um, but we decided to actually jump over into BK Connect and play around with some electrical data and see how that actually aligns with, you know, uh, the ground vibration test, the structural modes of an aircraft. So, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and stop the presentation and jump over to BK Canal. And uh, in the center here, or sort of on the left-hand side, is time domain data. And Mitch, if you want to, I'll let you describe sort of what these channels are and where they came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, these were all measured with, a, with an HBME drive system. Um, so what we have are the bottom three graphs that kind of look like a, a backwards dumbbell. Um, those are three-phase currents. So that's that's the current being driven by that inverter, and that's going to have that high-frequency content. Um, so we're starting bottom up. Uh, the, the middle graph, the one with kind of the flat line with little spikes on each end, that's speed. That's taken directly off of the encoder, um, and we get really good resolution on that speed. So in transient scenarios, you can really understand what's happening. So in this instance, we have a machine that's running at a speed, at a certain torque, and then it's given a load step, and it changes torque. So that little blip we see is, is the change of torque. Um, and then the very top graph, uh, that is our torque. And, and we can see that the torque has quite a bit going on. It's, it's not that super stiff line. And that's because we have um, torque ripple from multiple elements. Uh, we have torque ripple from the excitation, which is kind of a slower uh, ripple that, that we'll probably see a little bit in a moment. And then we have a higher frequency torque ripple, which is going to be more um, slot related. And, and magnetic really related. So we're really seeing that direct current to speed to torque, uh, which is going to be pretty cool when we start analyzing that data. Thanks, Mitch. So as Mitch pointed out, there's a lot going on here. Uh, and in a few minutes, we're going to zoom in and actually show you, because it's actually very visible in the time domain. But we also want to demonstrate when you take this time data over into the frequency domain, you're going to start seeing some interesting things. So if I take this section in the center of the torque, RPM, and current, and basically process it, you're going to see that 
Uh, the frequency content is actually in the range of where a lot of the structural modes of the aircraft. So if I come in and say, I look at the current, so here's all three legs of the current, and I look at the main, and I'm going to put a cursor in each one, you're going to see that, okay, the, the main frequency in the current is roughly 16 hertz. But because of the type of motor it is, it's actually twice what the RPM is. So if I look at the side lobe of the current, it's basically around the eight and a half hertz range, which is roughly the uh, frequency of the RPM. And if I jump back here and look in cursor, you can see here that the RPM is, is roughly 500 RPM. So all these frequencies, the interesting thing is, is they are down in the range of what structural modes most aircraft have. Anywhere from say, you could go as low as say three Hertz up to 20, 30 Hertz. So, hey, the RPM and current had the frequency content, but look at this interesting thing here. The torque does too. And if you look at the frequency of the torque, it's roughly 8.3 Hertz. So you may ask yourself, it's like, okay, who cares? Well, let me show you why. If I come over here and basically uh, start looking at some of the structural modes of the aircraft, you're going to see and if you see the, the mode table here, uh, my first mode is at 8.9 hertz. So that torque was at 8.3. So why don't we take a closer look? So I'm going to put the time domain of the torque here, and then I'm going to um, actually put the frequency domain of the torque next to it. And we'll go ahead and graph all these so you can see sort of what we're talking about. And re remember, you know, we Mitch was talking about torque ripple. Well, if we take and actually zoom in on this time domain data of the torque, you can start seeing one the transient. Now that's lower frequency. I think the transient is in the roughly I don't know three hertz range, four hertz range. But now start looking at the actual ripple that's on top of the stat. That frequency content right there is this frequency right here. Basically, 8.2 hertz, 8.3 hertz, like that. Well, you start looking now at say the, the first flexible mode, which is at 8.9 Hertz. First wing bending, Just a little more of the amplitude. So now can you start seeing how the number of motors that are on a wing and the fact that they're actually, you know, propeller type motors, or that's what the motor's driving, that the frequency content and the speed, the RPM of those motors, can line up with these structural modes. Now you're looking at uh, the lateral first bending of the fuselage, which is at 9.2 hertz. Now you can look at the 17.4 um, hertz mode, which is vertical bending of the fuselage. And that's this aircraft. Every aircraft is different. Every aircraft's first wing bending, fuselage bending are gonna be at different frequencies, but they will usually be for this type of aircraft in this frequency range. So you start looking at, you know, again, the different frequency content 
I look at the uh, current, again, 16.6 .6 hertz, which you might think, okay, it doesn't show up real large in the current or in the torque, but sometimes it don't take very much to excite these motors. It's depending on the damping to how sensitive they are for these types of excitation. Anything else to add there, Mitch? Uh, no, I, I just love this demonstration because, um, you know, on the electrical end, we, we started seeing this with guys doing system level analysis, getting you know, tens and fifties and hundreds of accelerometer channels. And, and this is just the greatest illustration of why characterizing electrical and mechanical in parallel is so important. You can tie all this back to an electrical signal and, you know, seven of them on a wing. It's, uh, it's wild stuff. And it's, it's very cool. So thanks for this uh, demonstration, Doug. Well, especially when you start looking at uh, electrical vertical and takeoff, you know, uh, and landing, where some of these motors, they will rotate from being horizontal to now being vertical or takeoff and landing. And now you're putting excitation into these wings in the uh, plane that the, they're the weakest in, you know, the, the vertical plane. So, so we'd like to actually show you uh, a couple videos of why this is actually somewhat important. So this is a missile. I want you to watch the fins on the missile as it takes off. Basically becomes just like a, a piece of paper. Well, that one, they were able to get through, say, the, the flutter condition. Well, this one, not so much. And this is in slow motion. But it uh, sees the same phenomenon, but watch what happens. Boom. Snaps the fins right off. That's why I was indicating that from a flutter standpoint, you can become catastrophic. Now, that's sort of classical flutter. Oral flutter is a little different. And at first, you don't quite see it. But give it just a, a few seconds here. You can see a little bit of whirl going on. But in this next uh, shot, you can really see it going. Now you could say, okay, that doesn't seem, you know, that, you know, catastrophic. Well, whirl flutter, like I mentioned before, is a little different. It's more from a fatigue standpoint. So where you attach the, the motors to the wings, you know, that damping and stiffness is, is very sensitive to this whirl flutter. Well, if you get into that whirl flutter, you're probably not going to have the you know, aircraft fall out of the sky. But over time, you probably will notice fatigue cracks. So th that's why whirl flutter is, is somewhat critical now because some of these aircraft are being designed to be unmanned. So if you're flying an aircraft and it's a manned aircraft, a pilot typically will notice these things. Well, if it's noticed, then it can be checked for. If it's not noticed, if it's unmanned, then you better be having that in your maintenance schedule. I'm going to uh, stop sharing and jump back to the presentation and basically provide you a thank you. And if there's any questions, we can.